We stand together as we go and in, uh, into a, a new portion of Romans chapter two on our way through the book of Romans, and uh, we're looking at a message titled "An Unknown Religion." I'm going to ask you to be uh, considering this for the next 55 minutes. An unknown religion. What are we talking about? We'll see here in a moment. Uh, we're in verses uh, 12 to 24 this morning, and I will begin reading the even-numbered verses out of the New King James Version Bible, if you would, if you'd pick it up in the odd-numbered verses. Verse 12, Romans chapter 2. For as many have sinned without law, will also perish without law. And as many as have sinned in the law, will be judged by the law. For when Gentiles, unbelievers, who do not have the law by nature, do the things in the law, these, although not having the law, are a law to themselves. For the day when God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. And know his will and approve the things that are excellent, being instructed out of the law. An instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, having the form of knowledge and truth in the law. You who say, do not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you, as it is written. Wow, I'm glad Paul is the one saying this. <laughs> Father, we pray that you would grant to us the grace of your Holy Spirit, that we might become not only hearers of the word, but as we just read, doers of the word. Father, we pray that your Holy Spirit would possess us, and Father, that you would use us, God, that you'd commission us to the world around us, but by not only proclaiming the everlasting gospel and the love of God through the cross of Christ, but also, Lord, that we would be lights in this darkening world. So, Father, we give you this time. We ask it in Jesus' name, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You can be seated, church. Strong words, of course. As the Apostle Paul delivers them, again, we're glad that it is Paul the one who speaks, a man incredibly qualified, that his background in Judaism and his lineage for being a scholar, a student, is something that is not only recorded, listen to this, not only recorded in biblical history, but it is recorded in secular history. His previous... Uh, Identity was known as Saul of Tarsus. Saul, the Hebrew word, Saul of Tarsus. And a man that was known to be an incredible student and zealous for the Judaism of his day. The interpretation of the Old Testament scriptures and how they were to be applied. The problem was, listen, the problem was that he was very zealous about applying how the rabbis, scribes and Pharisees, had interpreted the Old Testament. In other words, they made it very, very man-centric. They added the traditions of men to almost negate the word of God. And you, you remember Jesus addressing that. He says, you teach over the word of God the traditions of men, making the word of God null and void. And so this is now Paul the Apostle the greatest convert to Christianity that the world has ever known. 
and he speaks, and he speaks with power. Paul is a man who is speaking under the possession of the Holy Spirit, and um, what he speaks to us about today is uh, shockingly um, personal to all of us, and I, and I mean every single one of us. I don't care today if you're listening, watching, if you're here in person, if you're a Muslim, maybe you're a Buddhist, a Hindu, maybe you're a, a Jew, maybe you consider yourself a Christian, I don't care who you are. What Paul shares by the power of the Holy Spirit goes right into the heart of each and every one of us. And only the Spirit of God can do that. It's interesting to me that among the attributes of God that the Bible reveals concerning God's nature is the fact that our God is the uncreated God. You need to know that. Your kids need to know that. Mommy, Daddy, who created God? We worship the uncreated God. That's your answer to your kids. You got that? When they say, how old is God? Well, God is not old because he was never created. He lives in eternal state. He's the uncreated God. And because of that, the Bible tells us that he's omnipresent. It's a big word, and it means a big thing. God is everywhere, the Bible tells us. That's one of his attributes. He's everywhere. The second thing we learn from the Bible is that the scripture teaches us that he's omnipotent. God is all-powerful. Sometimes we wonder about that, don't we? When we see injustice or something going on, we wonder, where's the power of God? But you won't uh, wonder that long. You won't have to think that much longer. God allows evil to take place in this world as things are being played out in this globe. Satan, the Bible says, listen, the Bible says that Satan right now at this time is the God of this age. Doesn't that bother you? Now, it's the, it's the, it's the word God with a little g, but he's, he's the one running around, mucking things up and bringing destruction and death. He loves to destroy families. He loves events that are confusing and disasters. But there's a day when God will be exercising his omnipotent power. And by the way, it will commence uh, at a time where you and I will not be here. We will not see the beginning of his revelation of his omnipotent power. It's called the tribulation period. He begins to roll up his sleeve. <laughs> he raptures the church up. Then he rolls up his sleeves and he brings a seven-year period of time that is a real problem to the world uh, uh, that does not know God. And then we also know that one of God's attributes is the fact that he's omniscient. Omniscient means that his uh, ability is to know everything. Omniscient he has all knowledge of everything. All the time. And what is known in the doctrine of God's attributes, as we've mentioned previously, the decree, not degree, like earning a degree or the a degree of temperature, decree with a C, that the decree of God is that God knows all things, both actual and possible. He knows all things, listen to this, this ought to freak you out. He knows all things that could have happened, if they would have happened, he knows how that would have gone. So he not only knows what you're going to have for breakfast this morning after service. <laughs> if you would have ordered something else instead, he knows that. If you're going down a road and you come to a Y in the road and you decide to go right and you, do, and you go right, God also knows what would have happened if you would have gone left. That should bring comfort to us. Great peace to all of us. But equally true is the fact that there are certain things, if you'll allow me this bit of sarcasm, that they're, they're unknown to God. Of course, he knows everything, but I'm trying to make a point today that there are certain things, when I say unknown to God, that these are things that are unacceptable to God. Things like this, perhaps, is the fact that unknown to God is evil. Now, God knows all about evil, but God himself is not evil. So... Sin is another one. God cannot sin. Pastor, is there anything that God cannot do? Yes, God cannot sin. 
Sin is unknown to God. He's pure. Unbelief. Unbelief is unknown to God. Think of that one. Charles Spurgeon, the great uh, pastor of yesteryear in England, Charles Spurgeon said that unbelief is having faith in the devil. What a brilliant statement that is. And when we talk about unknown to God is hopelessness. Hopelessness is unknown to God. A lot of people today, the world is struggling with hopelessness. Of course they are, because there's no God in their life. Or I should say, the God is not in their life. Where God is not, hopelessness reigns. Where God is not present, there's fear. And listen, where God is viewed in an unbiblical way in the context of religion... You've got an unknown religion to God. God does not identify with that religion. He doesn't see it. He doesn't understand it. He can't cope with it because it is falsehood. Are you hearing me? This is a very critical thing. Because what Paul is going to be speaking about is just going to uh, fillet you and I as Gentiles. And then also, if you're Jewish today and you cling to the law of God, then let the apostles speak to you. Very powerful. So therefore, in Romans chapter 2, verses 12 to 24, we're going to see three pitfalls that you and I are going to need to recognize and identify and understand when it comes to this unknown religion that God's going to reveal. The first thing, we'll see three things, but the first thing today is going to be silence. The fact of the matter is that unknown religion to God is one of silence. Can you write that down, church, as we look at this? Silence. You say, what do you mean by that, pastor? Unknown to God is a religion of silence. Meaning this, that God, according to the scriptures, is a God who communicates. The God of the Bible is alive. He's real. You can't hide from him. Uh, you can't hide anything from him. And, and you need to take comfort in this fact that because normally that would cause you to just shiver with fear, right? You're just like, oh no. But the fact is this, that this God who knows everything is a God that is not silent, that you can be in a place today that you are in the most darkest, deepest pit of sin and or despair. And you should be happy to hear today that the God of the Bible, he knows nothing about a silent religion. It doesn't exist. And I love that. In my mind, I see a contrast between, between the true living God of the Bible and all of the dumb idols that have been crafted throughout all the millennia. Men bow down and worship idols with ears and noses and eyes and a mouth, and they can't hear, they can't speak, they can't smell, they can't relate. John chapter 4, verse 24, the Bible says, God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. I tell you what, we will not, of course, but that verse in John's gospel right there, that verse unpacked will just draw the line right down the middle. It had just cut you wide open and it will determine if you're a true believer in God or not because true believers worship God in spirit and in truth. I love how it, he covers both. To know the truth about God is to cause you to know him by spirit. And to relate to God by spirit is to understand his nature and who he is. That he's worthy. Because our God is a God who communicates. And so the first thing we see in verses 12 to 13 is that he's speaking to all people. The God of the Bible speaks. If today you have a God that is not speaking, I suggest you get a new God. Verse 12, for as many as have sinned without law will also perish without law. Notice, watch, I'll point something out here in a moment. Next statement. And as many as have sinned in the law will be judged by the law. Did you see how I stress the definite article? The first statement is regarding those who sin regarding law versus those who sin regarding the law. What is he saying? Paul is setting up in his genius argumentation. There are Gentiles and there are Jews. You say, well, I don't know which one I am. 
Are you a Jew? Nope, then you're a Gentile. <laughs> if you're not Jew, you're a Gentile. The whole world outside of being a Jew is Gentile. And what he's talking about, as we'll see in a moment, is that God has spoken, we learned this in Romans chapter 1, that his Godhead has been displayed to all that he has created. But this statement here in chapter 2 is announcing that there are those who have never heard the Bible. They've never heard a sermon. They've never heard or read anything about the Bible. And verse 12 is announcing up front that there are those who sin without law, but they will perish without law. See, but this makes no sense to me. Yes, it does. I won't belabor it, but yes, it does. According to the Bible, and again, tell your kids this. They need to hear this. Because everybody gets concerned about the poor man running around naked in South American jungles about his soul. Well, what about the guy running around in South America naked (laughs) with a bone in his nose? What if he doesn't hear the gospel? Well, Romans chapter 1 and chapter 2 says, don't worry about him. God is speaking to him. And he's speaking to him in a way where there is an internal law that God has revealed inside of that man or woman living in the Amazon. So you can take a big, deep breath and relax and not worry about that man's soul. You need to think about your own. The Bible says, to whom much is given, much will be required. Where little is given, little is required. But know this, all of mankind will stand before God in judgment. If you've been given much, it means that you'll be judged more harshly. That's why the book of James says, you pastors, you teachers, you better watch yourself because you study my word and you preach and teach it. And that's how I'm going to judge you in the day of judgment. The teacher gets the stronger Judgment in the day of God's examination. But the God that you and I worship knows nothing about silence. We often think that he's the silent God because we think he's not speaking. Oh, he's speaking. You know what our problem is? We are so busy. We're so cluttered. We have so much noise going on. I'm convinced always. I've told you before. I'm convinced now he's always speaking. I rarely listen. In fact, I'll prove it to you, and you you can prove this to yourself. When I relax and calm down, which for me, take a picture when that happens. (laughs) But honestly, I'll be very honest with you. If I'm gardening or mowing the lawn, to me, that is, God speaks to me more in times like that or in times of isolation for me. Now, I don't get isolation much, but what I'm saying is, if I'm walking or if I'm, whatever I'm doing, and there's aloneness, I hear God speaking. I don't hear the trees rumbling and some powerful voice that's amplified. No, it's deep, internal, and it's a, it's a revelation of words or knowledge or, or instruction that's not Jack. You know what I'm talking about? And it's not you. You know it's him. And he speaks to the person that doesn't have the Bible like you and I have, but they're not guiltless because he's speaking to them. And they know inside, this is right and this is wrong. And by the way, anthropologists will tell us every culture all around the world, no matter what they believe, have a right and a wrong law in that culture. And the Bible says it came from God. All of you evolutionists, you got, a tough, uh, you got a tough argument there you have. Trying to, trying to convince yourself that God doesn't exist, and yet on the inside, you have a moral code that you live by. And you argue trying to say that that was developed by input and by your surroundings. That's your argument. I just got news for you. This will ruin your day. You'll have a horrible day after I say what I'm about to say. God says, I placed that in you. And you may have never opened up a Bible in your life, but you know the question in your mind is, does God exist? And God is expecting you to nurture that question. He's asking you to stoke the flames of that little spark to see, is God real? Every human being is being touched with that challenge from God. And this is a fact. It's not something that we do not know of. 
It's a fact. Those that have sinned in the law will be judged by the law, the greater the judgment. So the voice of God is speaking. And this is a very powerful statement. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 11. Ecclesiastes 3, 11 is a tremendous verse, but watch this. It says he has made all things beautiful in his time. And right about there, I have this, by the way, I have this hanging in uh, my backyard somewhere in a flower cart. Somebody, one of you made it for me. It's beautiful. It's a little plaque. And it says he makes all things beautiful in his time. And it ends right there. That's not the whole verse. The verse goes on to say, also, he has put eternity in their hearts, except that no one can find out the work that God does from beginning to end. That verse is incredibly pregnant with challenge, is it not? Amazing. He makes all things beautiful in his time. That is the hope of man. We always want it better. Man wants heaven. Of course. But the truth is, the challenge is, he's put eternity in the heart of man. That creates a problem. If God says in the Bible, I put eternity in your heart, then you should be asking the question, does God exist? The reason why you ask the question is because he put eternity in your heart. What's going to happen to me when I die? Where did that come from? God, he put it in your heart. The curiosity, is there life after death? The question asked by Job. Why did he ask it? Why do you ask it? God put it in your heart. And the awesome truth is in his incredible power, God knows the beginning from the end and only God alone knows that. But it says right here, the word perish. What they both have in common, those that have a Bible and those that do not have a Bible, is the fact that without knowing the God of the Bible, you can own the Bible and wind up in hell owning a Bible. For that matter, you can own a library of Bibles, right? And wind up in hell because you did not believe or put into practice what's in the Bible. Or you can be that man running around the jungle and you know that it's wrong, but you do it anyway. And that word perish means, and all of you need to hear this because false doctrine, hello, church, listen, all around the world right now is a false doctrine being propagated that everybody goes to heaven, but just in case, if everybody doesn't and some people don't, they don't go to hell, they go to annihilation. The Bible doesn't teach annihilation. Jehovah Witnesses teach annihilation. What's funny about the cults, by the way, is that they knock on your door and they demand that you join their team. But then they tell you there is no hell. But you've got to join their team. Don't, I'm pausing for effect for now, for a moment. You need to join our church. Why? Because you need to be on our team. Why? Well, what's at stake? Well, you need to be on our team. Is there a hell? Oh, no, no, there's not a hell. Well, then why do I need to be on your team? <laughs> no, the Bible teaches that every single one of us will live forever. Did you know that? Read the fine print. John, chapter, John 5, Daniel chapter 12. All human beings will live forever. You just better read the fine print on the contract you're looking at. Make sure that you've signed up for heaven. Have you listened to God? God is speaking to people. Verse 13 says, for, and by the way, in theology, this is known as a parenthetical insert. That's why some of your Bibles have a parenthesis right there. For not the hearers of the law are just in the sight of God, but the doers of the law will be justified. In other words, that guy that's running around in the jungle, if he's obeying his conscience that God is speaking to him about, God's going to take care of him. Isn't that amazing? What's scary is the culture that you and I live in. For those of us who live in, in this advanced world, we have access, we have a phone, we have an iPad, we have some sort of tablet device. We have libraries, we have hotels that we can check into and read a Bible. If you don't have a Bible, go to a hotel. <laughs> Open up the drawer, read the Bible. Right, we've got the Bible. God is literally speaking in the sense that 
Your nation, your city, your town, your house had a Bible. God is going to say, in effect, did you read it? Think about that question right now. Dr. Gray, Dr. Dr. Donald Gray Barnhouse writes, people who think they are Christians merely because they do such things as attend church, listen to sermons, participate in a neighborhood Bible study, listen to Christian music, delude themselves, says the Apostle James. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror. For once he has looked at himself and gone away, he immediately forgets what kind of person he is. I always find that kind of funny. It's like you get out of bed, you look at your face in the mirror, and you could have like a, a booger on the side of your face, and you don't see it, but you check yourself off as being fine, and you go to, you go to work, and people are like... <laughs> you glanced in the mirror, you, con you concluded that you're okay, but you've got slobber on your face that's dried up over the night. And you ought not to go out in public until you fix it. But you wind up going to work for everybody to see it. This person, he says, the person who is satisfied with superficiality or a superficial knowledge of God's word is living a spiritual illusion, thinking he is saved when he is not. Wow. Wow. By looking in a mirror, he judges himself by himself rather than by the word of God that he knows much about but does not take to heart. His failure to obey what he hears proves he does not believe it nor expect it or accept it. His disobedience proves he does not trust in the God whose word he hears. And the more he hears it without obeying it, the more he piles up guilt against himself in the day of judgment. Jesus certainly had this on his mind when he preached the conclusion to the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 7, verse 24. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken unto him as a wise man who built his house on the rock, and the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat on the house, and it did not fall, for it is founded on the rock. Verse 26. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them, remember church, this is Jesus speaking, will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and the fear of getting sick or testing positive for COVID came <laughs> and beat on that house and it fell and great was its fall. Found it on the rock or found it on the sand? And Jesus says the difference is people's lives who have built on sand do not obey. People's lives who are built on the rock, that is Christ. They will want to obey. They will seek to obey. In fact, our problem, for those of us who are standing on the rock, is we are a judge to ourselves, are we not? Let's be honest. Those of you who are walking with Jesus, you don't need the Supreme Court to point out to you you're wrong, do you? The Holy Spirit is speaking to you because he's the God that speaks, and he's announcing to you, and he's calling out to you. And you, listen, you have the witness of the Spirit of God in you. Because God is speaking. The God of the Bible speaks. Please don't be that kind of Christian that Barnhouse is speaking about that you never hear from God. You never really hear from God. You have managed and mitigated God right out of the factor. Secondly, in verses 14 to 15, we see that unknown religion to God is one of silence, is the fact that he is speaking to each of us, every single one of us. Verse 14 says, For when Gentiles unbelievers who do not have the law, by nature do the things in the law. These, although not having the law, are law unto themselves. Now, you got to remember, Paul is a born-again Jew speaking to born-again Jews living in Rome. He's writing from Corinth, Greece. He's writing to those in Rome. 
There was a tremendous amount of born-again Jews, we call them believers, completed Jews. And he's challenging them. And he's saying, listen, for those of you guys who are cruising and saying that, I'm, hey man, I got the, I'm, I'm settled. I was in Judaism before, I got saved. I understand Jesus is Messiah, and uh, yet when I'm with all these other Gentiles, I've got a little notch above the rest of them. I'm a little bit better off. I'm kind of a higher uh, standard or a higher cut. And he warns because the Bible here says that there are those who by nature, notice this, the Gentiles by nature, God's speaking to them, and he's speaking to you. He speaks to me. He speaks. In verse 15, it says that these who show the work of the law written in their hearts, here it comes, their conscience also bearing witness and between themselves their thoughts accusing or else excusing them. Listen, in your heart, listen, you're not a Christian today, you're not a follower of Jesus, but you will agree with me. You have to agree with me. That is inside of you, you have a standard of living that to you is acceptable. So whoever you may be, non-believer, you don't believe in God, you have a moral code. And you believe it so much that you've lived your life by that standard. And church, let's be honest. There are non-Christians who live, some non-Christians live better lives morally than Christians. They've got a high standard of morality. What does it prove? Watch this. What does it prove, the apostle is saying? It means this. It means that they've got a high bar that they've established based upon their own judgment, but they're failing to recognize that their ability to place that high bar as a standard of judgment has come from God and his witness that is inside of them. It doesn't mean they're going to heaven. It means that God has shown them a standard. And Jesus says, and the Bible says over and over again, whatever standard you have, God says, by that standard, you will be judged. So when we look at people and we criticize or we talk about or we gossip about or we hold this standard to them, it's, it's actually true that that standard is looking right back at us. But you say, well, Jack, if I meet my standard, what if, what if I just have low standards, Jack? <laughs> and I meet up to all my low standards. Am I off the hook? Nope. Nope, what Paul is trying to get the believer and the unbeliever to see is that God alone is perfect and that we need the cross of Jesus. We need the resurrected Christ. That it's not being a good citizen that gets you into heaven, nor is it being a Jew and you're a scholar of the Bible that gets you into heaven. He says both will perish. No matter what morality, no matter what understanding, the Bible says in Galatians chapter 3, verse 24, therefore, the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ. All, everyone, listen. The law was our tutor. The word in Greek is pedagogus. I'll, I'll explain it in a moment. To bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. Everybody listen, by faith. You hear this. It's not by morality. It's not by standards. It's not by rule keeping. It's not by being good or bad. It's by faith. And the word pedagogus, the schoolmaster, I love this statement. This is Jew, Paul, the apostle, saying, therefore, the law was our schoolmaster. The, the schoolmaster in the first century church did this. When a kid was in class, the schoolmaster, the pedagogus, stood and watched the kids. And when one kid pulled on one pigtail, or spit gum across the room, or whatever he was doing, he had not to be doing, the schoolmaster let him have it. I don't know about you, but I went to a public school like that. Remember those days? Can you believe that? 
How many of you went to school like that? This is first service. You can, yeah. Did you get spanked at your school? Mr. Baranian. Mr. Baranian. The guy was about four feet tall and he had a paddle that was about four feet long. And I was very acquainted with that paddle. But in those days, uh, Mr. Allen would make us, uh, when we'd goof up in math class, Mr. Allen would have us stand up and he'd say, play the piano until I tell you to stop. And you know what that was? You had, to, you had to stand in the middle of the class like this and do this. You know what we would do? We would do that until we're wobbling and shaking and we'd fall over at public school. It rocked in those days, baby. That was awesome. <laughs> you, you learned stuff in those days. We, ain't got, we had no time for woke. We learned math and we learned geography and science. Well, anyway, I digress. He's the God who speaks. And the law is given to show you when you step out of line. The law can't save you. My Jewish friends, listen. You, are you keeping the law? You're commanded to keep it. How are you doing with that? I love my Jewish friends. I love my Muslim friends. They got rules. How are you doing on those rules? See, there's rules externally, and they're there. And they're always gnawing on you. They're always biting on you, as it were. And then there's a law that God writes in the human heart when he comes inside, and it's a joy. And you need to know that. Psalm 44, verse 21. Psalm 44, 21 says, For he knows the secrets of the heart. God does. Why does, it, why does he announce that? Look at verse 15. He's the God that is speaking to you. He speaks to the people, the nations. He speaks to us, all of us as a culture. But he speaks to you and I personally. Verse 16. In the day when God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. When Paul says my gospel, don't get excited. He's not making it up. When he says my gospel, the word means I am saying exactly what Jesus told me to say, gospel. I'm being faithful to delivering the goods that I was told to do. Okay, I appreciate that. God will judge the secrets of our hearts. I don't know how this message will eventually come across, but I can tell you this, for days now, I've been concerned with this thought, and I'll just be so honest with you. I've been so concerned for this thought, and that is for someone to think for a moment, fresh for the first time, almost like a spark of light. When the scripture says that God will judge the secrets of men's hearts, that, 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 that makes perfect sense to you. Are there not, listen, church, are there not secrets in the world? Of course. Do not people have them? Yes. Do you know a secret? Then why can't God know a secret? He knows. Oh, pastor, all my life I've been hoping and praying that nobody finds out about that thing. I've, it has burdened me for 50 years. It has been weighed upon me. It's crushing me. I'm terrified someday I might wake up and it's on the headlines. Let me tell you something right now. God knows all secrets. He knows them all. Psalm 139, verse 1 and 2 says, O Lord, you have searched me and known me. Notice the words past tense. He's not getting to know you. <laughs> hey, hi, Jack. I'd like to get to know you. No, no, God shows up on the scene right now today and says, I know you. Amen. I've always known you. You mean from the beginning? From the beginning. In eternity. I've searched you. I've known you. Verse 2 says in Psalm 139, verse 2, you know my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my thought afar off. Isn't that bizarre? Before you think it, God knows what you're going to think in the next 15 seconds or 15 minutes. He knows, he, see, he knows it's coming. And my argument to him has always been, then why didn't you stop it? <laughs> of course, that's a stupid question because God is saying, I want to see what you're going to do with it. I know what you're going to do with it, but you don't know what you're going to do with it. And you're going to decide to be a follower of mine or not. 
This is the danger of rejection. Paul in chapter 2 of Romans is talking about those who without the law or with an internal law or God's code, the Bible. If you reject God's truth, there's a grave danger. And he's speaking to you personally. In Matthew chapter 11, verse 20, this is, this is tough because you don't want to reject friends when God speaks to you. I know you're in a big crowd here right now. You think, well, yeah, I'm just going to hide in the crowd. People tell me that, by the way. I came to this church three years ago. I, needed, I just wanted to hide. No, I'm, have you, you hear that, don't you? I just, want, I just I want to find a big church. I just hide out. Well, we, we may not have detected you, but the Holy Spirit... He knows. But are you here for religious purposes? Because to that, is, that's unknown to God. But the truth is you should be here for personal reasons. Amen. Crowd or not. You should come to this place saying, where's God? I want God. Is there a God? And I'm happy to report that, yes, he's a God who speaks, speaks to nations, speaks to cultures, and he speaks to you personally. He's a good God. He's a forgiving God. But he warns, listen, such a price he paid for salvation. The rejection of that price comes at a great cost, friend. Matthew 11, verse 20. Matthew eleven twenty. Then he, Jesus, began to rebuke the cities in which most of his... Mighty miracles had been done because they did not repent. This is in the Galilee. Many of us have been there. These villages are there. Some of them are gone. The, just the ruins stand. But Jesus would do miracles. And he didn't do miracles to put on a show. He did miracles for them to see the power of God to believe in the message. That's important, everybody. Oh, I want to see a miracle. I want to see a miracle. You're probably are not going to see a miracle. Because you, you would go headlong for the miracle instead of the word. The miracle bears witness of the power of the word. Listen, God says, I esteem my word above my own name. Not miracles. We all need a miracle. Like, if we live in California, we need one, you know, every time we get on and off the freeway, we need a miracle. <laughs> but miracles aren't the point. It is the word that brings you to the knowledge of God. But what if you reject that? Somebody said, well, the God of the Bible sends people to hell. That is so not true. Listen, read the Bible carefully. The Bible says everyone's going to hell. He doesn't send. You're already on that train. We got to, listen, to get off the train, you've got to accept Christ. You've got to believe that Jesus died on the cross and rose again from the dead. The whole of humanity is on a train going down a track and there's a cliff coming. And the, listen, you got to get off that train before it goes off the cliff. But that train is careening through the night in pitch black darkness and you don't know if you'll have tomorrow. And so God doesn't send anybody to hell. Mankind is on its way to hell. God intervenes by love and says, get off. I've made a way. Jump. Does that make sense? Yes. So don't ever accuse God of sending somebody to hell. God did everything to keep people from going there. Hell is a default from our fallen nature that we received from our mom and dad, Adam and Eve. And so, though, verse 11, Matthew 11, says in verse 21, Woe to you, Chorazin. That's a town. Woe to you, Bethsaida. That's another town we visit. For if the mighty works which had been done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon in Lebanon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I say to you, Imagine Jesus speaking like this. 
it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, that was his ministry headquarters, who are exalted to heaven, will be brought down to hell. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I say to you that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for you. Wow, what's he saying? Sodom, listen, Sodom had no Bible. They will be judged in the day of judgment. But to those who have the revelation and the light, to reject the greater punishment, and you don't want that. The greater rejection, you don't want that. Secondly, in our study, we see that the unknown religion to God is one that is universalism. Universalism. See, what are you talking about? That, yeah, this is unknown to God. This is, this is something that uh, God, God would say to us if we were to say, everything is uniform, everything is universal. Um, as long as, listen, are you guys with me? Yes. As long as you're sincere about what you believe, it all works out good for you. As long as you're sincere. It doesn't matter what you believe, just be passionate about it. Universalism, all, listen, all roads lead to God, universalism says. Now, I have to tell you, the fine print is, that is true. Hear me out. <laughs> all roads do lead to God, because everyone has to stand before God in the end. But you need to read the fine print. You want to be on the road that leads to heaven. There's a big difference. Everybody will stand before God in the end, but you want to be on the road that goes to heaven. Okay, so yeah, all roads lead to God, but what road are you on after you get done meeting God? And Jesus said, I am the door, I am the way. And so listen to this. Universalism, God counters that, he knows nothing about it, where man is... And this will upset people uh, because this is the trend of our day. And it seems to cycle about every 40 years that man is, man is naturally good. Don't worry, we'll fix this. We're, we're, by nature, we're good. You know, I don't know if you know, that's new to you, but it, it's in history, it cycles about every 40 years. Well, that's a sense of universalism. And all are going to make it in the end. God says, no. The fact is, in verse 17, he's calling out a people to himself, isn't he? It says there in verse 17, indeed, you are called a Jew and rest on the law. The word Jew, Jew, Judah, uh, Jude, Jew, Judah. Is, if your name's Judy, Judith, that's all Hebrew, you know? And it means one who praises God. Did you know that? If your name's Judy, your name means a praiser. You are a praiser. So I like to use this argument when I'm in Israel, by the way. People will say all over the place, oh, I'm a Jew. Oh, you believe in God? Nope. So what do you mean, no? And it's funny, sad but funny. No, I'm a Jew, but I don't believe in him because where was he in World War II? If he was God, he would have shown up. I said, well, you, listen, you should, have, you should read Deuteronomy 28. It would have told you where he was. God says, you follow me, I'll bless you. You reject me and I'll leave you alone. That's what he said. He said, I don't like that. Why, accountability? Reality? We want to do things and not be responsible for the outcome. That flies in the face of the universe. It doesn't work that way. But God knows nothing about universalism making it up your way. No, he's calling out a people. And he called the Jews to be his source to preach the message of God's word to the ends of the earth. Isaiah 43 verse 10 says, you are my witnesses, says the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe and understand that I am he, 
Before me there is no God formed, nor shall there be after me. Verse 11, I, even I, am the Lord, and besides me there is no Savior. God said that through the prophet Isaiah to the Jewish nation. Are the Jews the chosen people? Yes, they're chosen. God called them to give the word to the ends of the earth and be his example. The Bible says that they rejected that. So God says, I tell you what, in the penalty box for you. He put them in the penalty box for 2,000 years, which is written in the Bible, by the way. He didn't destroy them. He's not going to break his promises he gave to them. He's going to fulfill every promise he made to the Jewish nation, to the believers, to the remnant. And by the way, you're sitting in history right now because right now, since 1948, there's a Jewish nation on earth a second time. But church family, just know this. God has called out a people. And right now in this 21st century, you who call upon the name of the Lord, you also are a people called out. You're known as the church. And God has a mission for you as well. But in this verse, he's announcing Indeed, you call yourself a Jew. So what Paul is doing, he's laying down incredible sarcasm. So you call yourself a praiser of God, do you? Yep, I do. He's going he's to say, so do you praise God? They're going to say, yeah. And he's going to ask them, how do you praise God? And they might say, I sing songs. And he's going to say, that's not what God wants with praise. Well, I'm in the worship group. That's not what he wants. I go to church on Sunday. That's not what he's asking for. Is your life a moving, living, breathing act of praise? That's the believer. Unique, personal, not universal. Have you had a confrontation with God? That's the challenge. Have you met God? Are you interested in meeting God? Do you care about that? And then the next thing is this, verse 17 down to 19, is he's calling us to our responsibility. It's not only that he's calling out of people, once he does, we are responsible. He says, and you make your boast in God. I know God and know his will. Listen to this. And approve the things that are excellent. You're going down the list. Being instructed out of the law, verse 19 says, and are confident. You've got all this stuff. Church, here's, here's how it applies to us. I don't want to spend time with the little time I have with the historical part of it. I need to talk about what is present. It would mean this. If somebody were to come up to you, me, they just walk up to us and they, they're witnessing. Let's say, you know, you bump into somebody at the beach and they, they're, they, they're handing you the four uh, spiritual laws, the track, and you go, hey, I'm a Christian, it's okay. If the guy says, oh, oh you, you're a Christian, that's awesome. Um, if he starts to ask you about your Christian life and you say things like, I, I, I go to church. That's not the answer. This is exactly what the Jews were saying. Hey, Paul, back off. I'm a Jew. No, I'm serious. I'm in. He picked me. Remember the story, Exodus, the whole thing? Come on. When we say things like, I went forward at a crusade, back off. I got baptized, leave me alone. Or listen, wherever you've come from, I was confirmed, I'm good. I've been approved by the council, I'm good. Those are the very things that the apostle is warning us about. Every single one of us should be, as it were, on our faces in attitude. God, you're amazing. Can't believe you saved me, but you did. I'm eternally grateful. Whatever, by the way, you want to do with my life, God, is totally cool with me. And just keep me close. You're amazing. And I'm going to follow you. And you go. And you live. It's the difference between what is in stone, the law, and what is in blood. Big difference. And again, for my Jewish friends, just remember this. You boast in the fact that you've got the law, you've got, you're a Jew, you've got the history, you've got the prophets. Just remember something. 
God declared Abraham righteous before Abraham was ever a Jew. The first Jew was a Gentile before he was a Jew. He was declared righteous before he was circumcised. Abraham was declared right with God before Moses was born. There was no Ten Commandments. Figure that out. And God gave the law through Moses, and then God says, keep these things. And, psst, oh yeah, Moses, by the way, in the day that you break them, you got to get an animal that's innocent and offer its blood because you've transgressed the law. That's how you can be forgiven. Did you all hear that? By the rule keeping of the law, you're not going to make it to heaven. You need blood. I find that fascinating. And then we're going to end. Well, we're almost, no, we're going to end. We're going to end. I'm going to do this. In verses 19 to 20, regarding universalism, we see that he is calling out our claim. What are we saying today? Are we saying that I trust in Jesus Christ alone? I see from Genesis to Revelation, it's all about him, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. He says that you yourself are, number one, you say of yourself you're a guide to the blind. Then Paul is saying, then why are you so blind? You say that you're a light to those who are in darkness. Why are you in the darkness? Verse 20, an instructor of the foolish. Paul is saying to them, then why are you so foolish? Number four, he says you're a teacher of babes, having the form of knowledge and truth in the law. Then how come you guys don't know this? Isn't that what Jesus said? Church, we're almost done. Isn't that what Jesus said to Nicodemus? Don't you know these things? You should have known these things. You're supposed to know these things. In verses 21 to 24, an unknown religion in, uh, to God is one of hypocrisy. God doesn't know anything about this. He knows what we know, people. Listen, that's the foundation to hypocrisy is that God knows what we know. You, verse 21, therefore you who teach another, he's speaking to these leaders, you who teach another, do you not teach yourself? Have you ever heard somebody say, do as I say and not as I do? That is brazen hypocrisy. You who preach that a man should not steal, do you steal? Wow, I read background on this and I'm sparing you guys a lot of grief. That statement, historically, the Jews in the first century Roman Empire often worked and, and uh, lived in what we would call today the banking industry. And they were notorious in the first century for doctoring up books. And say, Jack, you shouldn't say that. I'm reading historical books on this issue. And the Romans warned, don't do business with a Jew. He has another set of books. And Paul nails them. Can you imagine? He was so politically incorrect. So you preach that the losses don't steal, but you cook the books. Wow. In Galatians chapter 2, verse 11, I'm going to streamline this. Verses 11 to 13, Peter's hanging out with a bunch of Gentiles in Antioch, and he's eating with them and having a great time with them. But Paul shows up, and he sees, watch this, Peter's sitting at a park bench, you know, and he's sitting around, and they're eating pork chops and stuff. And, and Peter's liberated in Christ. He's hanging out with these Gentiles. And then there's a contingency of people, come, uh, Jews that are born again Jews. They're coming from Jerusalem. And Peter sees them come. And Peter jumps up, wipes the barbecue sauce off his face, and goes over and sits with the other guys so that he's not associated with those Gentile believers. And Paul heard about it. And Galatians chapter 2, verse 11 to 13, I want to see Spielberg do this on the screen. Paul shows up, Paul shows up and says, hey, Peter, I am not even going to ask you to step over here and talk about it. I'm going to talk about it in front of everybody. <laughs> you played the hypocrite. And you not only caused these people to think that there's two groups of people that can be the church, 
You even wound up stumbling Barnabas, who's like the most loving sweetheart dude in the world. You even stumbled him. You even caused him to commit a sin by your hypocrisy, Peter. I mean, there's big Peter looking down at little Paul, and Paul is just <laughs> duking it to him. And he, and he announces, Peter, you played the hypocrite. I want to show you some scenes, some uh, images here. I don't know if you know what a hypocrite is, but this is a hypocrite. Did you know that? Yeah. Hypocrite. It's the Screen Actors Guild's logo. No, no, forever. Long before Hollywood. In ancient Rome, in Greece. This was, if you were an actor, this is, this is the, the shingle, the banner. And why the mask? Because whoever you are behind the mask is irrelevant because we are at a play. We don't care about your reality. Put on a sad face or a happy face. Play your part. Next, next shot is another for, portion of it. This is called a hypocrite. Hypocrite. A false face. And modern day pictures today, things like this. Right? You see, oh, it's so beautiful. It's so good. I understand that. See, the more closer it gets to home, the more we justify it. Oh, yeah, I got one of those. I got one of those. Okay. But it's, the mask is a masquerade. Masquerade means to parade yourself as someone else. Here's the scary part. Hypocrisy, when you exercise hypocrisy, you parade yourself as someone that you're not. Okay, and it depends, you're like, you're like a chameleon. It depends on what culture you're in, you project. When you're with Christians, you're Christian. When you're back at work, or when you're with the guys, you're with the guys. You change in mask. God says you're a hypocrite. Right? And the next picture. You know what's scary about this? Behind the mask... The guy could be an accountant for Morgan Stanley. He could be a school teacher. He could be a contractor. We don't know. We not only see a guy with a mask on, we see two personalities, light and dark. There's people who go to Mardi Gras who do things that would never do things if their mask fell off. They go behind the mask because when they wear a certain mask, it allows them to really do what they want to do, but not to be identified. Why? Watch, because when the mask comes off, are you listening? Yes. When the mask comes off, the real mask is really on. God sees the real mask, and the real mask is the false life you're living. And so this is critical I end here. He knows what we know. He knows what we do. Verses 22 to 23. And in verse 24, he knows who we are. And I have to tell you, you guys, this is really tough stuff, and you can get any commentary and author that's written on this, and it's tough stuff. But I got to tell you, I've got the easiest job of them all because... I know a church this size, there's going to be hypocrites, and yeah, that's why I don't go to church, I'm full of hypocrites. Yeah, listen, there's hypocrites all over the world, and a hypocrite technically means to know what to do and you don't do it. But friends, listen, you guys come here because you're serious about the word of God and you can take a message like this. You know, I could never go visit another church anywhere in the world and give the message I just gave you. You know why? Because we're family. I'm happily your pastor. And you, guys, and, and you guys hear this and you see. And I want to tell you in closing how the scripture here says, for the, for the name of God is blaspheming among, blaspheming among the non-believers because of you. I want to thank God that the name of God is honored by people because of you. 
And that is a very, very precious thing to say because I get to say it. So church, let's stand, if you would, as we close out. (laughs) I'm going to give you the four saddest passages in the Bible. You ready? You heard me, saddest. This is sad. In Genesis 3, Adam and Eve sinned, and God said, Adam, where are you? That's sad. Second is Jeremiah 2, 5. God says to Israel, what injustice have you found in me? How have I wronged you, right? That you would go and follow idols? That you turn on me? This is the God speaking. Why, why have you become unfaithful to me? God says to Israel. This is a whopper. John 1, 10 to 11. He, Jesus, was in the world and the world was made through him. Can you imagine walking on the dirt you made? And the world did not know him. He came to his own. Who's that? the Jews, and his own did not receive him. And that's the next one and the final one. It's the shortest verse in the Bible. John eleven thirty five. 35, Jesus wept. Did you know why Jesus wept? He was at the funeral of, a, of Lazarus and everybody's crying and weeping and Jesus tells them, I'm the resurrection and the life. If you believe in me, you'll never die. And all the mourners were there and they're all crying. The Bible tells us when he saw them weeping, he wept. He knew what he was going to do. He was going to raise Lazarus from the dead. But he wept over the grief that pain causes. He wept over the plight of man. Can you imagine seeing your kid that you poured your life into? only to wind up wasting that life that you poured into them. They just wasted it and crashed their life and now they're strung out or behind bars and you did everything you could to give them what you never had and you tried your best to, and, you, and you, you weep. God looks and he weeps. Listen, my dear friend, God wants you with him and he wants you to experience him. Well, hey, thanks for listening, and uh, we appreciate you. And of course we do in this time and in this age. Us being together and linking up together to get the Word of God out is actually ministry being fulfilled. And in fact, if you would like to subscribe, please do so. Hit the subscribe button. Tell your friends about us. And listen, if you'd like to help us get this out on a broader scale, you can support us by hitting on the Give Now button. And look, we're going to continue on with or without you. We're inviting you to join us. No pressure. But if you'd like to link arms in this venture, you'd be greatly appreciated. So listen, keep praying for us. We're praying for you. God bless you. And we'll see you back here real soon.